The $93 billion plan to put astronauts back on the moon. On the morning of 17 March, the world's largest set of doors rolled open to reveal an aerospace marvel at the Kennedy Space Center in Merritt Island, Florida. There in NASA's biggest building stood its newest rocket, the most powerful ever built, and nearly 100 meters tall. That evening, an enormous wheeled platform rolled slowly out of the building, carrying the mega rocket through the coastal night towards its launch pad. Like many space enthusiasts around the world, Rene Weber, a planetary scientist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, stared in awe at the webcast feed. That thing is going to the moon, she thought. Welcome back to Tech Trends for All. Before we proceed, kindly subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated when we release new videos. Without further delay, let's dive in. And unlike any rocket in the past half century, that thing is going to carry people to the moon. NASA plans to use it to send crews back to the lunar surface, more than 50 years after U.S. astronauts last walked there during the Apollo program. The upcoming push is called Artemis, after Apollo's twin sister in Greek mythology. NASA aims to kick off the Artemis era later this year, with the first launch of its mega-rocket, called the Space Launch System (SLS). That mission, dubbed Artemis 1, will fly without any crew around the moon, and back on a trip lasting between 26 and 42 days. NASA hopes to achieve its next giant goal of landing astronauts at the lunar south pole by the end of 2025. To support the Artemis program, NASA has contracted companies to send a series of robotic landers to the moon, which will carry NASA-funded instruments to explore its surface and enhance the science that could come from astronaut missions. The Artemis program faces huge challenges. Notably whether the U.S. Congress will be willing to pay the cost of several billion dollars per flight, but if it proceeds anything like NASA has envisioned, it will give a major boost to science education and public awareness. Much as the Apollo program, born from the Cold War era space race between the United States and the Soviet Union, inspired a generation of scientists and engineers. Science would benefit too. The lunar south pole has never been explored by people or landers although several robotic missions aim to get there before Artemis astronauts. Because sunlight never reaches parts of the South Pole, some areas could have been frozen for billions of years. They might contain ice and other compounds that are rare on the mostly bone-dry moon. By finding these volatile substances and studying them, scientists can gain insights into the origin and evolution of the moon, as well as into the broader history of the solar system, including Earth. Think of it as building upon Apollo, Weber says, the Apollo program completely revolutionized our understanding of lunar science and of the moon itself. Gearing up to go, Artemis got its official start in 2017, when former President Donald Trump signed a space policy directive telling NASA to focus on sending astronauts to the moon. The roots of the idea trace back further to at least 2004 when then-President George W. Bush prioritized sending astronauts to the moon and onto Mars. In response, NASA began designing heavy-lift rockets, precursors to the SLS, that could take people and cargo beyond low-Earth orbit. In 2010, President Barack Obama canceled the Bush-era plans, telling NASA to focus on developing its rockets to send astronauts to an asteroid in preparation for going to Mars, thus sidestepping the moon. Congress kept the rocket program live, providing tens of billions of dollars for NASA to develop the SLS. If and when it finally lifts off from the launch pad in Florida, the SLS will be NASA's first new spaceflight vehicle design since the space show debuted in 1981. The SLS has been running into last-minute glitches, however. In April, an important test that was supposed to fill the rocket with fuel and then drain it revealed some problems, including a faulty valve and a hydrogen leak. NASA is working to fix the issues. During the Apollo moon landings from 1969 to 1972, 12 white men walked on the lunar surface. NASA has said that Artemis will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. Its astronaut corps includes several women of color, including planetary geologist Jessica Watkins, who flew her first space mission to the International Space Station on 27 April. Doug Hurley, a retired NASA astronaut who has flown in low Earth orbit, says that sending people back to the moon will be an extraordinary moment in human history, especially with modern photos and videos of the moon. See map of some moon landings. The first human to see it with their own eyes in 50 plus years. It's going to be huge, he says. It will be viral, those first pictures. 
Unlike the days of Apollo, Artemis is happening in an age when private aerospace companies are developing their own smaller rockets to get to the moon. This era of commercial spaceflight is opening up a wide range of opportunities for U.S. scientists to send robotic missions to the lunar surface. In the time since Apollo, we have not had regular surface access to the moon, says Barbara Cohen, a lunar scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. NASA's first return to the lunar surface could happen by the end of this year. If all goes to plan, two companies partly funded by NASA Intuitive Machines in Houston, Texas, and Astrobotic in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania will make two landings on different parts of the moon. Intuitive Machines is targeting a dark region called Oceanus Procellarum, carrying NASA instruments such as a video camera to capture the dust plume created by the lander as it touches down. Astrobotic will travel to Lacus Mortis, a volcanic plain in the moon's northern hemisphere, with NASA instruments including a mass spectrometer that will measure how exhaust gases from the landing affect the chemistry of the lunar dirt. In the time since Apollo, we have not had regular surface access to the moon, says Barbara Cohen, a lunar scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. NASA's first return to the lunar surface could happen by the end of this year. If all goes to plan, two companies partly funded by NASA Intuitive Machines in Houston, Texas, and Astrobotic in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania will make two landings on different parts of the moon. Intuitive Machines is targeting a dark region called Oceanus Procellarum, carrying NASA instruments such as a video camera to capture the dust plume created by the lander as it touches down. Astrobotic will travel to Lacus Mortis, a volcanic plain in the moon's northern hemisphere, with NASA instruments including a mass spectrometer that will measure how exhaust gases from the landing affect the chemistry of the lunar dirt. By looking at how the gases interact with the surface, we can tell a lot about how they migrate and eventually get lost to space or trapped in cold polar reservoirs, says Mehdi Benna, a planetary scientist at Goddard and principal investigator of the experiment. These landers are the first in a series of NASA's commercial lunar payload services, in which the agency hires companies to fly scientific instruments to the moon, rather than taking them there itself. It's a risky proposition, because none of these companies has previously built lunar landers. At least five more landers are planned in the coming years, each going to a different location and carrying different scientific instruments. Another Intuitive Machines probe is supposed to land in 2024 at Rainer Gamma, which is a striking example of a geographical phenomenon known as a lunar swirl. These are highly magnetized patches on the moon's surface that appear as sinuous bright patterns. The planned spacecraft, called Lunar Vertex, will place a small rover in Rainer Gamma to gather magnetic measurements to try to unravel how lunar swirls formed. The solar-powered rover will survive for just one lunar daylight period, or around 14 Earth days, but in that time, it could roll hundreds of meters from its landing site, traveling across light and dark-colored parts of the swirls, and measuring the strength and orientation of the magnetic fields in the rocks. It's definitely going to be the most intense two weeks of our lives, says Sonia Tiku a planetary scientist at Stanford University in California who works on lunar vertex. In 2025, another commercial lander aims to bring two seismometers to the lunar far side. They would be the first seismometers on the moon since the days of Apollo. By studying moonquakes generated by geological activity and by meteorites hitting the surface, scientists can refine their understanding of the moon's internal structure. Weber, who is part of the team, says this could be the start of a geophysical network on the moon, much as the Apollo astronauts dropped off scientific packages including seismometers, magnetometers, and other instruments at different locations. That observing array lasted until NASA switched it off in 1977. To do the same experiment at different places is scientifically valuable. Weber says, That's all I have for you guys for today. If you liked watching this video, please make sure to click the like button, subscribe to our channel, and click the bell icon so that you may be notified when we upload a new video. Thanks for watching.